Welcome to the Compact Podcast. I'm Jeff Schillenberger in for Matthew Schmitz this week. And today we'll be discussing the vice presidential debate between J.D. Vance and Tim Walls and the longshoreman strike on the eastern seaboard. Joining me is Sarab Amari. Sarab, you watched the debate. You've already responded to it both on Twitter and uh, in a Substack on Compact Substack that just published. So in brief, what was your takeaway? First of all, I think not just I, but many others, including most of the kind of uh, liberal or left of center media, the consensus among all was that J.D. Vance won this. Um, You know, depending on whom you ask, it was either a crushing victory or just, you know, a narrow victory. Uh, but I think what's less, what's more important than that is the fact that we saw, as I put it in the headline of my Substack piece for it, that this was the J.D. Vance we'd been looking for that, or that I'd been waiting for um, after a very successful Republican National Convention. Uh, it felt like the Trump campaign was somehow adrift. It was undergoing what I called an identity crisis in a cover essay for the new statesman. Um, And it was beginning to just sound more and more like a conventional libertarian ish, just a conventional conservative campaign, only meaner, right? You know, more willing to cavort with unsavory types like Laura Loomer or to accuse, you know, Haitian migrants uh, of of eating cats and dogs and practicing voodoo, so I think the campaign was in a bad place, and um, it was yeah, partly reflected in the in the polls as well. Insofar as national polls and battleground polls mean anything, um, Harris was consistently up, at least oh, not not by an enormous kind of margin of percentage percentage point margin, but still she was up both nationally and in, in several key battleground states. So. You know, I think the Trump campaign needed a reset, and Vance delivered one. Uh, he was uh, he was friendly, he was warm, and he was constantly looking for consensus with uh, with Waltz, which I think was just a nice touch for someone who had been framed as being, you know, mean and weird, etc. Um, so the tone was right. He was sophisticated. He was nimble. It was just, I think, it was a bravura rhetorical performance. In my Substack, I highlight two things that just, for me, reminded me of the Vance we'd been, I'd been v- waiting for, which is to present like the most sophisticated case for uh, populism to a, na- to a national middle audience as opposed to just trying to like shore up the MAGA base. And two things he did. One uh, came about a third of the way through where Tim Waltz, Governor Waltz, attacked uh, Vance for um, basically just like not listening to the experts. He's like, when it comes to the COVID or economy or any number of things, you guys just don't listen to the experts. And you know what? Like politics is about listening to the experts. Uh, I'm only slightly paraphrasing, but politics is not in fact about listening to the experts. It's the it's the art of prudence of you know taking in what the experts say, but then just it's not about a matter of a politician who feeds like his problem to an expert you know computer and the expert computer feeds something else out and that's what the politician is supposed to enact that's not what the art of politics is about and vance's comeback was devastating he said well didn't the experts say that for four decades that offshoring manufacturing that reducing our manufacturing self-reliance would be good for for workers that it'd be good for our sense of uh independence etc cetera, etc cetera. and anyway, of course it hadn't been and that trump pointed this out in 2015 16 um and i think Walsh just had no response to that he sort of he mumbled and he said well I, i'm against offshoring too but vance didn't let up he said well but you said that we should listen to the experts that that's what the expert consensus uh counseled 
uh, in those post Cold War, early post Cold War decades. Um, I think that was very strong. And I'll just highlight one more and, and then I'll shut up. The second um, moment came when uh, it actually began with Vance giving praise to the Biden administration, saying one of the most pro-worker things that Biden has done, and it's a point I've made in many places where I've said that Bidenism and Trumpism are in continuity with each other in some respects, was Biden's decision to retain the tariffs against China, indeed to widen them. And that he, he said, he said, that's one of the most pro-worker elements of the Biden administration and Kamala is running away from it, which is true, you know, constantly calling tariffs attacks on consumers and being dismissive of that a, a kind of import substitution approach. And it was just so sophisticated because it, 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 it's a point that, you know, we've made in compact under my byline and that of uh, those of others, but that it's not the kind of thing you expect on a national debate stage because it's kind of a sophisticated kind of needle to thread to say, yes, Bidenism has these positive elements that arose out of a response to the mid-2010s Trumpian populist uprising, but now Kamala is abandoning that. I thought that's just such a kind of, it's such a jujitsu. It's, and, and of course, the way he did it was a lot smoother than what I just did. So put those two elements together, the kind of willingness to question expert opinion and say, no, politics comes first. Uh, politics should enjoy primacy with this kind of like reminder of situating Trumpism in a kind of longer and post neoliberal arc. And you got a very strong debate performance. Probably those things are not the things that most people pick out when they wanted to say why Vance did well or why he won the debate. But I think for like compact purposes, those are the most important elements. So the thing that struck me coming out of this, and I agree with your sense that this was sort of the best, it was the best version of Vance and the, uh, the best version of what many hoped he would be, which is somebody who could articulate uh, you know, Trumpian economics in particular in a way that would reach beyond uh, you know, the MAGA world and, and you know, make an articulate case for some of these positions. And you know, reflecting, as you were just pointing out, the fact that many of these things have actually been absorbed into the broader consensus through the Biden administration, which on the other hand, has been weirdly, and I think Matt Stoller pointed this out, that you know part of what this showed and, and Walls' somewhat fumbling response to the point about expertise and tariffs and uh, you know outsourcing and so on, uh, is that you know the Democrats have actually not been good at at selling the more economically populist parts of Biden's record, and they they haven't they haven't quite been comfortable with that. I mean, part. You know, perhaps because it means acknowledging a a way that they establish a continuity with Trump, who they usually want to paint as as uh, a complete aberration. So, I mean, two things that stood out to me here. One, you know, this raises this question of sort of Trumpism without Trump or Trumpism after Trump, and you know, in a sense, there are sort of two versions of that. One which we already see is uh, the, the aspects of, of Trumpian economics that have been absorbed into the policies of a democratic administration. And then the other would be, you know, the anointing of Vance as a kind of successor, you know, perhaps somewhat more sort of respectable, um, Yale law school trained, uh, you know, uh, kind of polished and and articulate spokesman of some of these positions. Now, I mean, th th this is part of why, and and maybe these are just a couple of of slight challenges uh, that you know that that don't diminish Vance's uh, performance, but I think you know raise a couple questions, right? So the first is, as many people noted. The main point at which Vance fumbled after an extremely smooth performance, or or was you know found himself stuck confronting a question he couldn't answer, which was right at the end when he was asked, you know, essentially point blank, did Donald Trump lose the 2020 election? He was, for reasons anyone would know, literally unable to say yes, he lost the election because if he did that, Trump would. I mean, it's it's hard to imagine how he would react. Um, it, he, you know, he he could actually risk being dropped from the ticket. I'm not sure. So, um, but but this is a problem, right? Because it suggests 
there's uh, you know you might you might think of it as the the Trumpian the role what's the role of the Trumpian id or or the kind of libidinal energies of Trumpism in relation to the policies that have emerged out of it right which can be articulated in a more um, in a more nuanced and and respectable manner right um, because this is the core issue of the Trumpian id right which is is the sense of being um, of, of grievance, of having been cheated and robbed of, of being, and, and these things are not unrelated, right? In other words, the, the sense of the country having been sold out by experts, by economists, by the bipartisan economic consensus is, is not entirely separable from these more kind of conspiratorial modes of, of grievance politics, right? And, or from Trump's own, kind of deep libidinal investment in his own grievances. And so, you know, the question in part, which I think was dramatized in that moment is, can you excise the, you know, again, uh, at this point, not, you know, no longer fringe um, policy shifts that have come out of, of Trumpian economics in particular, you know, can you can you excise those from this kind of, you know, um, this kind of festering pit of of resentment and grievance, which I think is embodied in this um, this refusal to uh, acknowledge that he lost the 2020 election, right? And so, to the extent that Vance was unable to answer that in a, in a remotely coherent way and essentially deflected and tried to change the subject, um, you know, that, that suggests that that problem remains unresolved. So I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, I think that's right. Last night I tweeted, um, that Waltz's overall, it was a losing performance, but the two areas where he was strongest was, I think he came across very well was one, um, the, Healthcare issue, where Republicans just don't have a good healthcare policy. What they stand for is no one wants, and yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what what Vance was trying to get out of that. But it just was he just didn't come off as strong. Um, and the other one was January sixth, um, and I think it's for the obvious reason. I mean, we needn't spell them out. It's for the obvious obvious reasons that you said. I think. You know, given the various pressures that JD was operating under, he did about as well as he could, which is to say, well, I'm focusing on the future. Well, you can only go so far with that because there are certain things that happened in the past about which one should have, you know, uh, something to say, which is, uh, you know, that, that can stand the kind of moral tests. So that it's a little dubious. But then I think, you know, to pivot to, uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, refusal to accept the outcome in 2016 was about as good as you can get because although it didn't lead to something as kind of ugly and overt as the January 6th riot, um, her refusal to accept her loss did set the stage for four years of bogus kind of Russia gate hoax investigations and, and uh, you know, the sort of special counsel, et cetera, which, which really hampered Trump's ability to govern because he was always from the beginning, he was under this kind of prosecutorial eye and under this prosecutorial pressure. I think given all of that, um, you know, he, he played as those, those cards as best as he could that said, you know, like, I wish we lived in a world in which first of all, Donald Trump had accepted that he lost in 2020 and that, you know, that therefore his running mate, uh, someone who's very smart and knows the score could be able to just say, yeah, Donald Trump lost in 2020. So the other thing that kind of struck me in relation to your observations about the economic dimension of the discussion and the kind of bipartisan, the new bipartisan consensus that was kind of awkwardly reflected, um, although not really acknowledged by Walls, uh, and in fact kind of denied by Walls, is you know, Trump did just release this um, this sort of economic plan that he published as an op-ed in Newsweek. And you know, I mean, there is kind of this question about, um, you know, again, I think it relates to this question about the kind of libidinal, <laughs> the kind of id of, 
of the the populist right versus the the more kind of policy oriented side of it you know as represented by say like Oren Cass's uh, piece in the Atlantic kind of defending tariffs from the economic uh, you know from the economists right who still tend to um you know sh- coalesce around this anti-tariff position and i mean it is worth noting that like there are good cases to be made for tariffs. Um, again, those cases have sort of been um, accepted by the the you know many people on the Democratic side as well. Um, nonetheless, you know the Trump version of it is you know this kind of universal ten percent tariff. You know where you're you're say putting a tariff on like bananas and you know fruit that can't even be grown anywhere in the United States and and could never be grown right there is no like sense in which importing bananas suppresses the domestic de- banana production so you know it is actually kind of tied to this much more libidinal sense on Trump's part that he um you know that that like any money we give to another country is somehow like money that we're losing so it's a very de- it's a very zero sum uh conceptualization of of economics and i think this is actually a problem um at least to the extent that this whole vision is grounded and and is is necessarily tied to trump's own career because it's actually not a sort of growth oriented um, position, right? It, because it, it actually conceives of economics as a zero sum game, um, in which you can't grow and anything you give somewhere else is necessarily a loss to you. And, you know, you saw this in this, um, in this, uh, op-ed because he's basically saying like, we need to compete with China to like have factories here, which if you think about it, you know, I mean, you brought up in your Substack piece, like that, you know, there's this long history of sort of labor arbitrage, right? Now, you know, there's an aspect of this that is Trumpian kind of populist protectionism. There's an aspect of it that just sounds like the red state race to the bottom economic model where you're saying, well, we're going to slash, and he says, we're going to slash 10 regulations for every every new one that's added. Um, So there is this kind of anti-regulatory side, there's this tax break side. So it's essentially the red state model on a global scale, which seems like it's in tension with a more um, kind of future growth and and building oriented vision of economics, because basically, and and so, you know, I I, I think when you, (laughs) what what I thought after reading this is like, Trump's instincts are on this are often so kind of bizarre, like, it, you know, while you can, I, I think Cass makes a strong case for the r- rationality of tariffs um, in his recent piece, for example. But like, there are legitimate ways that Trump's conceptualization of economics is 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 in fact deeply irrational. Now, what's interesting is that I think that irrationality was maybe necessary as a kind of corrective to the irrational expert consensus of the prior few decades. Right. So, in other words, for somebody to come in. And take this wrecking ball to this prior consensus. You know, perhaps this this sort of far more aggressive, and in many ways itself like quite irrational, um, sort of form of economic nationalism was was necessary as a corrective, right? Because it had gone so far in the opposite direction. But you know, there there is something about it if you read this op ed that's quite troubling because I think it it suggests sort of you know what we need to do is like. Um, slash regulations and taxes so low that we can like attract, you know, sweatshops back from Southeast Asia. So we can have people working in sweatshops here, which like is kind of intention with saying, you know, we need to recreate the American dream of, you know, middle-class manufacturing jobs for people with, you know, high school diplomas, you know, that those are, those seem somewhat intentional. So I'm just curious, you know, the, the, again, I think this question of like, the the sort of rational core versus the the um the more kind of you know in many ways quite retrograde um um sort of impulses that seem to to drive it forward yeah it's it's to connect our compacts to podcasts we have of course the um this flagship podcast and then we also have another one called uh, blame theory which is anchored by uh, Mr. Schulenberger, a- a- and we did an episode on 
Michel Foucault, at which I was one of the one of the guests, and I was drawing on this essay I wrote for uh, on Foucault on the 40th anniversary of his death uh, for Compact. That that's called the Bleak Genius of Michel Foucault. If you want to check it out, but um, it, it, it's I, I mentioned this because in uh, Foucault's 19. 19- uh, 79, some 1978, 79 seminar, the birth of biopolitics, which is only barely about the birth of biopolitics. He makes this distinction between, um, mercantilist or raison d'etat state accounts of, uh, of liberalism of the earliest forms of liberalism and then classical liberalism. And then finally neoliberalism. Now, again, keep in mind that he was writing, you know, 45 years ago and he was presciently aware of what neoliberalism would kind of shape it would take but when it comes to the raison d'etat state you know it's it's it is a he basically Foucault says that it's a zero-sum account of economics that there is a total amount of gold in the world and either England gets it or France gets it and they need to like be prepared to go to war with each other so that you know either either thinks it's going to get the uh, uh, the uh, it has to try to secure the limited amount of gold in the world um, over and against the other, and I think so. I just think that that's just part of the part of this tradition, um, w- w- this way of thinking about economics that's never gone away. I mean, I think Nixon had often a similar mentality. Um, the other thing, which I because I don't I don't want to get into the comp- you know the all all the complexities of this, but. It's notable. I don't know if you know this, Jeff, but it, it, to connect the the bodily, the, the the immediate human body to the body politic, is that Trump apparently had the reason Trump doesn't exercise. He doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. But the reason he doesn't exercise he, is he believes like every human being is born with a limited amount of like vitality or mana. I don't know if you've read interviews where he says this and like. Exercise is a wasteful dissipation of the total and limited amount of like vitality juice or mana that you're blessed with. And so <laughs> just to end the conversation, I guess, on this humor where he does have this mentality of like, which is, clearly you're right. It's also part of his economic vision. And I think it's a limitation on his on his um, neo-mercantilism is <laughs> this view that there, there's just a limited amount of stuff in the world. And, you know. It's zero sum. You better hold on to it. Grab as much as you can and hold on to it. Yeah, just one one final note on this debate was I noticed a lot of commentary just, you know, including from liberal commentators sort of saying like, wow, what a relief. Like, you know, these were the adults in the room. They behaved. They were, you know, respect. I mean, people expected it to be more pugilistic because both. Uh, debaters had been, uh, you know, noted for their kind of harsh rhetoric and so on. But in fact, it was, you know, it was quite sort of convivial and and polite. And there were moments of friendliness between them and so on. So, you know, people were, all, but then also people noted like, yeah, there was serious policy discussion, right? They really got down in the weeds and okay, maybe it was a little boring at those moments, but like, hey, we had these guys who are, who are serious about discussing policy. And, you know, what struck me with that was like, and and so I saw this vein of commentary that was sort of like, wow, what a relief not to have this kind of, I mean, essentially to to not have a figure like Trump on the stage, right? Which, I mean, is is kind of bizarre because I feel like when he first emerged on the scene as a, as a political figure, it was just so electrifying to have someone who, who just didn't give a shit about any of the, the sort of politesse and normal um, routines and and rituals of of political discourse, and you know now people are just kind of exhausted with that. And <laughs> like you know, sort of just seeing a wonky policy discussion between two candidates, um, you know, on the main stage of American politics, like seems refreshing now. Even though ten years ago it was like that was just boring and and dumb, and like people wanted this kind of pugilistic, um, you know, highly libidinal kind of, uh, you know, and, and I, I just remember like the Republican, uh, debates in, in, um, in 2016, uh, you know, the primary debates, like, 
you know, Trump was just an absolute wrecking ball, um, just like humiliating and destroying these guys who were just kind of trying to behave like normal politicians and just completely wiping the floor with them. And that was like quite exhilarating at the time. But now it's like people are just kind of exhausted with that performance on some level. So they're they're actually excited, you know, even liberals to be like, wow, you know, it's nice to hear J.D. Vance like so cleanly articulate these ideas uh, that we thought, you know, were just this kind of weird stew of of like grievances and eccentricities, but you know, can actually be turned into a policy vision. Like, what a relief! Anyway, it was it was fascinating in that that aspect of the reception. Yeah, I'll just very quickly. That <laughs> I was not the only one who said this. Every, every I think I feel like everyone said this that like actually both of the 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 vice presidential nominees were just so much uh, so much better than the principals whom they ostensibly work for, you know, like, uh, Waltz is, you know, is, although he didn't do that great in the Bay, I think everyone said he, most people said he lost, but he was just so much more articulate, kind of, um, capable of, you know, summarizing complex issues and, you know, just had this grasp of, of, of facts and arguments that you, you actually wouldn't see Kamala managing to pull off. Like Kamala won her debate because, now turning to the other side, you know, you got Trump on the other side who's very ranty and makes everything personal and can't can't never there's no opportunity to go low that he doesn't take and all of that. And then of course Vance again, so much better than him, fl- fluent, articulate, uh thoughtful. Anyway, so um yeah, so I think I think I, I lots of people I I saw saying this is like wow, just both of them are so much better than the principles. So a uh, final item is a uh, strike that just began the longshoremen at the, the docks and ports of uh, the eastern seaboard of the United States are on strike. I just actually happened to go past the uh, some of the docks in, in Brooklyn and saw them out last night. Uh, and, you know, this could be, uh, depending on how long it lasts, uh, quite economically impactful. There's a debate about automation here. Uh, they, you know, part of what they're interestingly echoing uh, the the actors and and screenwriters strike that Sarab wrote about, where there was also a concern about automation. You know, in in the form of kind of uh, you know essentially kind of deep fakes being used instead of actors. Um, in this case, of course, it's simply the the long term process, which has already been underway for decades, by which the uh, America's ports have been more and more mechanized. Um, and so the, you know, the, there, there are far fewer longshoremen than there used to be. Um, so this is, you know, uh, unlike that, it's, it's, a, it's a debate and a, a set of concerns that have been ongoing for a long time. The longshoremen are a powerful union because they occupy choke points of global trade and are able to, you know, essentially turn off and on the spigot. So this is quite impactful. There's a lot of discussion about it. Um, some on the center left are quite mad at the longshoremen because they think this could be an economic blow that would be harmful to the the Democrats. Um, you know, as I see it, this is just a fundamental illustration of what union power is, right? It's it's being able to, um, ex- you know, flex your muscle in such a way that grinds the economy to a halt um, if if necessary to extract concessions from capital. So, what's your uh, what's your impression of this? situation. Exactly what you said toward the end, Jeff. Um, you know, a year ago, maybe nine months ago, I was having lunch with um, a senior figure in the AFL-CIO who had read my book, Tyranny, Inc., and we were t- we were he was asked to meet with me, and he, we were talking about, um, you know, the fact that there's this all this new organizing going on in sectors you wouldn't think of before, like retail and services and, of course, Starbucks, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, well, this, you know, all this must make you optimistic. And he said, you know, not really, because at the end of the day, over the past generation or two, capital has just amassed so much wealth, capital and power that it can throw just millions and millions at, at winning various contests with labor. And so he was just like, look, you know, if you want to change that balance, it takes pain. It takes, it takes shocking the system. Uh, 
And so, of course, I agreed with him because, you know, in my in my book, I mentioned that, yes, like in some ways, the New Deal was an elite consensus. It was elite driven FDR. <laughs> you know, I'm reading his bio- one of his biographies right now. And of course, he's just the kind of an Ameri- as, as aristocratic as an American can get. Right. He was famously a member of the of the Northeast gentry. And yet he comes around to the set of policies to try to. Um, you know, in a way, save capitalism from itself to to create a new labor peace at a time when um, at a time when instability threatened the system, and that's the key part. That um, yes, you know, elites can strike class compromises, but they won't do it, you know, absent militancy on the part of working class people, and that's what you saw, you know, in the ni- in the beginning of the you know late nineteenth century through the nineteen tens, twenties, and thirties. That was the age of you know, really turbulent labor capital relations. And that was, it was one of the backdrops uh, of the New Deal. And so likewise, you know, you've had now this period where bosses have just become so used to lording it over labor and society has become so complacent about that, that it's, that people are shocked when longshoremen say, hey, we're going to, sh-, and I don't, again, I don't care about the substantive issue as much, but when they say, we're going to shut it down, we're going to make, li- we're going to, I think one of the, uh, you know, uh, longshoremen that I saw interviewed on Twitter, or at least the clip was posted on Twitter, was like, we're going to bring you to your knees. That's, that is labor's power, understand. You know, like that's, we talk about collective bargaining and, and arbitration, all the things that labor unions do in relation to management and all that. But like the premise of all of that is that the, our model of economic organization cannot run ultimately, even with all the automation today, if the people who do the work refuse to work and if they hold those choke choke points, as you said. So that's the and it, and it's kind of funny to me that when that when people who some people who it's inclu, who are sort of pro labor in a soft way are confronted with that, suddenly they're like, well, well, whoa, we gotta send in the marines now, like. Get these people. It's like, hey, that's that's the basis of labor's power. Um, it's not the only basis of labor's power, but it's a central one. They can make appeals and so forth in other ways. But yeah, what do you you know? What do you think? And so, like, and we're entering this kind of age of industrial warfare, and we need industrial peace uh, domestically. Well. If, if we don't want stuff like this, people have just got to get a fairer shake. And with that, we'll bring things to a close. Thanks to Rob. Listeners, if you like what you're hearing, please rate and review us and subscribe on your favorite podcast channels. And please subscribe to Compact, compactmag.com slash subscribe and read everything we publish. See you next week.